All engines, no matter what kind they are, they all consume oil. But what we're concerned with is when we have excessive oil burn, or sometimes it's called excessive oil consumption. So you're probably familiar with this. You know, you're filling up with oil, and when you go to do your regular oil change, you pull out the dipstick, and all of a sudden there's no oil on the end of it, right? That would be unusual because it's a change, right? So previously you've had regular oil consumption, and now you're having higher oil consumption. So why could that be? Well, there's a few reasons. Um, just to summarize them here, you've got leaks in the valve guide or um, seal leaks, liner scoring and scuffing, an overloid bore, incorrect ring installation, ring sticking, as well as high oil volatility. Now, when you look at all the components in the engine, there's a variety of places that need to be lubricated. But when we go into sort of problem solving mode, it's actually pretty easy to figure out most of the time where it's coming from because there's only so many places that the oil can come from. So, you know, looking at the diagram, if you have oil burn, that means that oil must be in the combustion chamber in order for it to sort of burn off. Um, and that's how it, you know, escapes in the exhaust system. So it can only really get there from one of two locations. It can either come from the bottom or it can come from the top, right? So the bottom end or the top end. Now, at the top, realistically, the only thing that's kind of being val uh, lubricated is sort of your cams as well as uh, your, your valves. And so the pathway for oil to get down into the combustion chamber, it's got to leak past the valves. So it's helpful to kind of understand how those are sealed. So generally we have um, valves, which are this kind of trumpet looking um, valve. And they've got uh, valve guide seals, and there's also a valve guide. Now the valve guides um, sometimes are integral uh, to the block, sometimes they're not. Um, so it's just dependent on the design of the engine and usually on uh, the material that the engine uh, engine block is made from as well. But, you know, just so that you can get a, a better visualization. So here in this particular engine, we have the cam at the top and then you've got the rocker arm and that's actuating the valve. So the direction of the leak would have to go past uh, the valve, right? So that's, that's one way that it can happen. So if we have, um, let's say, a, a lack of integrity in that seal, then that's one way that we can get excessive oil consumption. The other way that we can get it is from the bottom up. And realistically, you're not going to go through the piston unless there has been an absolutely catastrophic problem, in which case oil consumption is the least of your problems. Generally, when we have a high oil consumption, it means that it has to get past the rings somehow, which of course seal against that, that liner. So how exactly could that happen? Well, there's a, a few different ways. First of all, right, let's consider how um, those seals work. So a piston has to travel up and down and it's doing so on the inside of a liner, right? As it's traveling up and down, it's actually traveling on a fluid film. So we generally have two different types of rings. The ones at the top um, help seal off the crankcase from combustion, right? And the ones down the bottom help seal off uh, the combustion chamber from the oil in the crankcase, right? So. If we have a lack of integrity to one of those seals, um, then that could lead to excessive oil consumption. Now, one of the ways that that could happen where we get a misfit between the rings and the liner is if we have abrasive material that gets caught either in the top land um, or you know, in that ring, ring groove area. Right? So you can imagine if we have something abrasive like uh, silica, for example, um, that as it travels up and down is slowly going to wear out the liner and what we basically get this is obviously a very exaggerated picture but we get an area which is not flush with the rest of the liner so if we were to take a top view of it now let's say that we're looking down into the crankcase right we have a liner and we have the piston and then we have the seal that uh, which is the obviously the ring then if we were to have a bit of abrasive material traveling up and down continuously in the same spot then eventually we'll wear a groove in it right so that's, that's one way that we can get um, a mismatch between the shape of the, uh, the, sorry, the liner as well as the rings. Now, another way that we can get it is if we have what is kind of called a, an overload liner. So if there is actually a mismatch in the shapes of the two. Um, so this is a reasonably common occurrence in engine rebuilds where something isn't honed correctly. So if we get a mismatch in those shapes, then again, Right? As you can see just from the geometry, the, the two shapes don't match and therefore we have an incomplete seal. 
One of the other ways that we can get is if we actually have ring wear. So in some circumstances, maybe uh, the ring has worn out. Usually they, they have, they're made of materials which are designed not to wear out, but in some cases they can. Again, you get a mismatch between the two surfaces. And now we have an opportunity for the oil to get past the rings and into the combustion chamber. All right. Now, the other thing to note um, is how does this show up? How would, you, how would you recognize that you had some kind of liner wear? Well, usually if you take away the piston, most of the time, if you're given a new liner, it'll have this kind of cross-hatching pat pattern. Now that cross-hatching pa pattern is very intentional. It's not, not just uh, machining marks for the sake of it. That, that cross-hatch is designed to actually hold oil um, on the liner. So remember the piston has to travel up and down on a very thin oil film. Well, that oil, you know, because of gravity wants to, <laughs> wants to slide off the liner. So we give it a little bit of surface roughness to hold the oil to there. So generally when you've had um, liner scoring or, you know, bore polish, you see that show up in, um, you know, an area of the liner, which is usually, you know, vertical, uh, that doesn't look like the rest of it. So practically, what does that actually look like? So here you can see in this first arrow pointing towards the regular crosshatch pattern, and then you get some liner scuffing or scoring, and then there's some areas of liner polish as well, right? So that's how you would recognize that that has occurred. All right, then when we actually take a look at the design of the rings, right? The Let's say, for example, if you look at the combustion rings, which are up top, they generally, there's a, a few different designs to these, and they're all designed to do roughly the same thing, right? So they have a bit of a shape to them, which enables them to use the pressure of the combustion gases to increase the seal against the liner wall. Now, there are, as I said, a few different profiles to these, but many of them work in roughly the same way. So the idea here is that if the piston is traveling up, right, then it's traveling on that oil film, but the friction wants to drag um, the right side of this uh, cross section down. Right, so it's actually going to move a little bit in the liner groove, right? And now the face that it's presenting the, to the wall is one which wants to slide up and down on that oil film. If we reverse the direction of the piston, so now the piston is traveling down, then the friction on the right side of that liner, right, is actually now in the upward direction. So it's now going to rotate. And now in this position, it, it's actually scraping the oil back down into the crankcase. Right, so that's how it's designed to work. However, in some circumstances, we get people who actually install the rings upside down. So maybe they're not aware, for example, that rings can be installed upside down. Maybe they think that it's sort of bi-directional. And in that case, what we're doing is we're actually scraping oil up into the combustion chamber. And so that's not ideal, right? So that can be one reason that we have excessive oil consumption. Um, now I'm aware that not all of these uh, designs have just two rings. Often, right, there's three, so there'll be some kind of intermediate ring as well, right? Now, the other thing that can happen, right, is that we obviously have all oil on the liner walls, and the liner wall is extremely hot, right, because it's exposed to those combustion temperatures. So the other factor which can um, uh, cause, well, not really cause, but contribute to excessive oil burn is the volatility of the oil itself. We've gone through this before where we've talked about the difference in molecular weight distributions between, let's say, for example, a group one and a PAO. So if you look across the distribution, the viscosity is kind of the, the average of all the different uh, molecule sizes within the oil. And the idea is that as you further refine um, the, the base oil package, right, what you're doing is you're narrowing the peak. So there are fewer molecules which are in this dotted box, right? So there are fewer molecules with very light weight which want to volatilize off. So if you have a much narrower band, that means that your engine oil has less volatility and you will likely have less oil consumption.